do your job right, get your correct education, because if you fuck someone up, this is your responsibility. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, your number one fitness and performance resource in Switzerland. Today, I'm happy to welcome Patrick Funk, strength and conditioning coach specialized in CrossFit and author of the Package Online Program. Hey, Patrick, thanks for coming on today. Love it. I'm so excited to be here. That's good to have you, man. Can you give a little bit of your background for people who might not know who you are? Yeah, hundred percent. I love the fact that you call me Patrick Funk because actually the CrossFit scene, every just everyone just calls me Pack. So we can just keep up with the Pack because it feels the only person calls me Patrick is pretty much is my mom. She's the only one, and I know when she says Patrick, I'm like, oh, you fucked up big time. So, I'll stick. So, I'll stick uh, with Pat then. <laughs> okay, I love it. Perfect. Yeah, um, Pack. Um, I'm from Germany. I'm 20. Oh, it's so weird. I'm always thinking about how old I am. I'm 29 years old now, turning 30 in a few months. So um, it's getting closer to the masses category. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm doing um, the sport of CrossFit since um, 2012. I've studied sports, I've done um, I've lots of trainer licenses, I have my own um, CrossFit, pro- I, I, I'm not allowed to call it CrossFit program, but functional performance, functional fitness, elite programming, whatever you want to call it. Right. So I help people who are doing a functional training, um, who do functional training for, the, for being a competitive athlete. So I support people here, also on a generic level, up until P, um, supporting people who are doing this on an elite level. Um, building up a big project here in Düsseldorf right now at the moment where we will establish a performance center for people who are doing this sport on a competitive level. Mm -hmm. It's just open gym. The the whole facility will be designed uh, with a competition floor design. So we have a competition rack. We have lanes on the floor. We have all the machines and all the equipment you need so that people can come there and train. Coaches can come there and have weekends when they prepare for competition and athletes who want to just get themselves really fit specifically for competitions are super welcome and have everything they need over there. Doing the sport as well on a uh, competitive base. So I've competed a lot um, in team, individual. I also took a little bit of the dark side. So I was very naive and stupid when I started um, this sport. I was uh, thinking I'm Superman, He-Man, Batman, Spider-Man all in one. And I can just train and train and train. Recovery, I don't need it. My body told me this is not happening. So I, I suffered lots of injuries. I had a disc prolapse. I was out for like one and a half years. Fucked up my shoulder big time. So, And then I had a massive inflammation in my lower back again. So three times uh, it pushed me down to like almost zero. And I always fought my um, way back up, which gives me a lot of experience that I can give back to people who are doing the sport now to tell them like, look, the way you are doing at the moment, the way you are doing it at the moment, you are running towards getting fucked up very fast. So this right. was probably like, like the longest introduction you've ever had on your podcast. Oh, believe me, that was a very short one, but it's, uh, you know what? I'm not, I'm not opposed to, to, to long intros. I think the background of the coach is, is always really interesting <coughs> and or coach or athlete and in your case, both. Uh, how did you first, you know, kind of find CrossFit or did it find you? Can you talk about that? How that happened? It was funny, but yeah, I, I can still remember like it was yesterday. So I had a very close friend back in the days and we were always running to the, to, to the main gym. And the only thing we did there, so I played basketball on a higher level. I was never super, super talented. So I always was a defense machine. So people let me train. So I trained in the sec, uh, with a team in the second league, but I didn't play there. Mm. I played one or two leagues below and I was never very talented in making like scoring and that kind of stuff. But it was always like the coach came to me and was like, that dude over there makes 25 points per game. He's making 10 today. So that was pretty much my job. Right. So I was a little bit tired of this. And then I started doing fitness, tried so many different other sports on the side. And then I went to the global gym all the time. And we did basically just biceps curls and chest pumping. And just, I literally was walking around like this, like these people you see on the streets and you're like, dude, just walk normal. And then from one day to another, a friend of mine just left and said, like, I'm doing CrossFit. And I was like, yeah, dude, CrossFit. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> this stupid stuff is not working. And then, like, half a year later, he comes back into the gym, and I look at him. He's like, what the fuck did you do? 
like the way like his body was shaped the 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 output and intensity he had all of a sudden and he felt so like strong and like his conditioning went up so bad and i was like just take me to wherever you're doing that so i went there and i did my first session and it got me hooked within a second because they told me because it was a fairly new gym and they got me hooked on this there's also competitions and you can do it individually you can do it in a team and then there's that the, the massive thing which is called the crossfit games but everyone can participate through the open and they just got me from right from the first second and i was yeah. always very strong and very like skilled because i did because just for fun i was always once per week after my basketball training i went to the to the gymnastics group um after that because i wanted to be able to do a backflip and a front flip and muscle ups and that kind of stuff so when i started crossfit i had such a massive advantage because walking on my hands never an issue muscle ups had it right from the start so it put me above so many people right from the start and i was strong because we did a lot of strength training in basketball so I was fairly good at the beginning. So that just got me hooked. And then this competition thing, and it felt to me like, you know what? The stuff I'm missing with my current sport at the moment where I'm not scoring and I'm just doing defense and that kind of stuff, that I would probably have with, uh, with CrossFit where I can actually do it as an individual athlete and like have my experience and can achieve being in the top five, whatever, winning competition whatsoever. That got me hooked. And then ever since, I've quit everything. Like gymnastics contract, <laughs> quit it. Global gym, I've quit it. Told my basketball coach the day after, dude, I'm just leaving. I need to do this crossing thing. And <laughs> uh, I think I had, a, I had a membership for a swimming pool as well because I tried to do a little bit of stage diving. All those four things, ciao, gone. How soon after you found CrossFit did you consider or did you start coaching? <clears throat> oh... Okay, that's a tricky one. Um, I'm a massive believer in, so what we're doing as coaches is we have a massive responsibility to people. We can make them feel better. We can improve their life. We can improve their lifestyle. We can improve their health, their mental game, which is getting more and more important in these very fast days in our environment. So I'm a strong believer in do your job right, get your correct education because if you fuck someone up this is your responsibility so i was always very i knew i have a good way of interacting with people mm -hmm. so i did obviously give little bits of tips here and there a few tips here and there but only with people where i knew i tell them to move your right arm the right arm would go up if i would go to a person like move your right arm and then the the, the pinky toe was moving i was like ah. I, I i was just scared in doing that so i was like okay you need to get the proper education first so i did the level one two years after and i felt like oh my gosh i know nothing like i, I was just blown away and it, it made me even more scared i had a very cool, had cool people around me at that at, at that time so i could shadow a lot of people then i started to reading books and I, I listened to podcasts and then i would say starting crossfit two years later i did my very like three years it was more like 2012 then we moved two years it was two and a half years after I started CrossFit that I started coaching. Mm -hmm. I had some sort of experience because I helped a little bit with basketball coaching in the, in the, in the global gym. I coached a, few, coached a few people with strength cycles and their split training. So I was already good with the social stuff. So I could work with people, mm -hmm. but having the knowledge to actually do proper coaching started two and a half years later. Can you talk a little bit about, because you started, you found CrossFit in 2012 it's been eight years now. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of CrossFit since you started uh, until now and how far it's come as, as a discipline, yeah. as a sport, yeah. as a methodology? Sure. There's, there's many aspects to it. So just, just go on that. Yeah, sure. Love it. Love the question. Because honestly speaking, um, to, in 2012, or let's say when I did my level one, because then I was also a level one certified coach, we all thought, okay, we know it we know how the ship is uh, how the ship is sailing we are the brains now we will change the world and the way we used to coach back in the days in our mindset the mentality was like all in every day 24 7 it needs to be hard you get blisters on your hands this is awesome your shins need to be bloody it needs to be this rough whatever sport as heavy as possible stupid as fuck super naive and no wonder i got injured with that type of style of training because my body at some point told me like until here and not uh, further. So um, 
it was a very young sport. The thoughts behind it was already, it was the same 2012 uh, as it was today, just the way how people absorbed all this knowledge and brought it out to the people was just incorrect, I would say. We were not educated enough. We didn't know um, what accessory work. What is accessory work? What is basic conditioning? What is recovery? Arresting, arresting needs actually doing nothing. That's interesting. So I thought it's a muscle in my body. How can I train it? That was the mentality back in the day. So it was very, it was fun. Don't get me wrong. We loved it, like smashing the gym and going down there and just having all the people around us. But these days, and this is also something that I learned along the way, and this is what I give back to my people who are following my programming is everyone is individual. Everyone has his own intensity. Everybody is working differently. Everybody absorbs intensity in a different way and has a, a different output so along the way i love the fact that back in the days it was just crossfit then they started to add this crossfit gymnastics crossfit weightlifting then all these other courses where like when people are very good very specific in certain topics they got mm -hmm. a, um, we say like people started to hear them so at the beginning you were level one coach you, you knew everything stupid the, the, the variety of input and coaches and experience we got along the way is so much bigger now. People know all these things like accessory. What does it mean to do unilateral training? What does it mean to do isometric training? What does it mean to do plyometric training? What does it mean to do basic conditioning, sprint training, isolated training, all these kinds of things, because especially when you do it, this a sport on a, on a competition level, it is so important because everyone knows it. So you need to implement that into your training. And I love the fact that the coaches stop being super arrogant and egoistic and be like, I know everything and started really to listen and absorb different topics and different, different um, ways of training and especially coaching other people because these days it got a lot, a lot better. I think we still have a long way to go because let's be honest, the level one is very good. But people who, I don't know if you've taken the level one. I have but people not. Who are t okay. But let me tell you that people who are taking the level one, when I'm sitting there as an experienced coach, I'm like, okay, well, so now they're certified in doing and in, in being a coach in that very complicated sport. I think, and, and they're doing, don't get me wrong, CrossFit is doing a great job towards that because they have now the level one the level two, the level three. It wouldn't surprise me if at some point they are saying like, before you open the gym, you need to have at least level one, two or three because now you get your level one, you can open the gym and you can call it CrossFit. Mm, difficult in my opinion because there's so much more. That's what they tackle in the level two a lot more is the fact that they tell you how to approach a client, how to work with the group, how to do a great timing to, throughout your class, what to look at and what's, mistake is the biggest that an athlete is doing right at the moment at the beginning we saw five mistakes the coach was standing there um, make your back straight push your knees out head up um, take a deep breath in and please put all the whole foot on your on the floor and then the athlete or the client was standing there like uh sorry super overwhelmed what should i do so that's how we worked with the over coaching was a big thing back in the days i mean in the surrounding that i have i don't know how it was in different other other areas around the world but this is just how i experience it and this is getting so much better these days people see five mistakes and they are able to say like this one is the biggest mistake please let's fix that fix that one first then we go to the next step so the the skill level of the athletes uh, of, of the coaches got a lot better but there's still a, a long way to go I hope that answered the question. It does. It does. And I, I like that you brought up, you know, plyometric sprint training, accessory work, because it almost seems like at the beginning, CrossFit was in, and I'm maybe generalizing a little bit, but because it's such a, there's so many elements to the sport. There's so many different exercises you can use. You can virtually do anything because of that. And because of the focus on intensity, everybody kind of rushed to that and said, oh, we just need to do that. And because we're doing all those movements, we're doing it in a really varied and complete way. But like you, like you just said, um, nobody talks about plyometrics. Nobody talks about sprinting. Uh, accessory work at the beginning was almost vilified. Like, oh, you're using a machine? Yeah. What? Oh, oh, you're yeah. doing bicep curls? Why? You know? Yeah. Love it. You know, now everybody, now, now, the, 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 now the, the, the common thought is, oh, you know what? No, no, actually, you know, bicep curls can be really good for, you know, elbow health and all those things if you talk about lots of gymnastics and like, yeah, <clears throat> come such a long way and, and, and really evolved. How, how did you 
try start integrating those different facets of maybe segments of coaching and training and physical preparation that are, were not part of the the original CrossFit, let's say, mindset. How did you come to add all those pieces to your to your puzzle? Hundred um, percent. I think I got injured. I'm a very competitive person, and back in the days, back in the days, I was I was fairly good in the sport, so I belonged to the top five in Germany easily. Um, my, my, my intensity output and my output for qualifier workouts and in competition was great. And then from one second to another, it was on hold because I fucked up my back. There was always that little pain. It was like, yeah, you know what? That's fine. When I warm up, it's gone. One day, my dad came to the gym, tried to annoy me in training. And then there were a few people around me. So I started a, like a ground fight. You know, when you try to catch someone, then he's like, okay, stop it. And then the moment I released him, the pain set in and it just destroyed my world so bad because I couldn't, I couldn't. Honestly speaking, I couldn't even go to the toilet without mm. having pain sitting mm. on a freaking toilet. It was just so annoying to me. And I was frustrated. And I was like, okay, we, th we think of CrossFit and this is the way to coach. This is the way to train and it should work, but it doesn't. My body doesn't feel that way. I felt exhausted. My back was just sh shattered and I couldn't do what I wanted to do. So back Back in the days, I started to read books. I started to listen to other people who were doing specific trainings and everyone started to get to know about CrossFit. I mean, it came with a boom. Everyone in, let's say like a, a triathlon coach, a gymnastics coach, especially weightlifting coaches, all those people, they got to know about CrossFit. And they all, they all had this little smile on their face like, I see what you guys are doing it over there in, in CrossFit, but this is not the correct way to do it the way you're doing it at the moment. And we as CrossFit were like, shut up. We know what we're doing. And then, because I always had that feeling, so why are they thinking that way? Why are they like, okay, you're missing that piece, you're missing that piece. So I started to listen to people who are doing specifically just weightlifting, just running, just accessory, just gymnastics. And what I got to know from all those different sports, what they're doing within their sports, let's say someone struggles with um, pulling and they can fire the lats, they can stabilize the shoulder, but the biceps is doing nothing. What we would do in CrossFit, we would, put, we would add bands and then tack, boom, they would start doing banded pull-ups. But the main issue, the accessory that actually would need to happen is the neurological connection from your brain to your biceps. You could do as many banded pull-ups if you want. As soon as you take the band away and you can still not fire your biceps in that muscle chain, it's not happening. So to take a step back and say like, take a freaking dumbbell and do biceps curls to get the connection so that your biceps is firing. That's something that was so mind blowing to me back in the days and so interesting. And you can put, you can take that through everything, through running, mm -hmm. weightlifting, gymnastics, um, body weight training, everything. And back in the days I was like, okay, wait a second. Am I the only one who is seeing that? So, okay, I started to educate myself. Well, I had time. Uh, usually I was training eight to nine times per week. So I had time to just go out there and listen and read and, um, and talk to other coaches and get educated. <clears throat> so I was slowly getting a hang of this. Okay, that's maybe good to implement heart rate zone. I love heart rate zone training. Mm -hmm. You have a freaking machine inside of your body. If it beats too much and it runs into zone five, you're probably not in your comfort or learning zone. You're basically in the panic zone. So this little tool here on your arm or on your, uh, like the, the heart rate belt is the best thing you can use to make people realize what kind of intensity they're training in. Mm -hmm. So this is something along the way when I got injured, I was like, okay, I'm listening to all of that. Now I want to implement that into my way of coaching because I think this can set me above a lot of other people. And still, in my opinion, my jar is half full. I'm still not perfect at everything. I, for example, I have three athletes I'm coaching on a very individual base. No, four athletes, I'm sorry. And um, one athlete struggled with rowing and I'm working very closely with Concept2. So I was like, I'm not the best dude in explaining how to row. I'm not the best coach in here. So I called someone from Concept2, a close friend of mine. I was like, hey, could you have a look at the rowing technique from my friend? Because I think you can do it way better than me. So my athlete learned something. I learned something. And he gave the proper insight and technique parts for rowing to this person and i'm still doing that today when i have someone struggling with um, let's say gymnastics and it comes up to a point where i'm like okay until here i feel very very comfortable in coaching you to a very high level but the next step you're still not getting it i think i need to ask someone else to help me and i think that came along the way with that 
back pain that I have because I ask a lot of CrossFit coach, obviously in the first place, this was my community. I ask about back pain. It's like, acid it out, uh, move a little bit, do a little bit of stretching here, do a little bit of stuff here. Nothing helped. And I was like, you have basically no clue how to fix me, how to fix my back, how to fix my injury. Because let's say, let, let's be honest, if you do a sport on a higher level, there will be some sort of etching, a, a pain and problems here and there. Mm. And I realized that we as CrossFitters, or back in the days, the coaches, they were not educated enough to actually deal with all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. basically through injury, I learned that we actually need to be a lot smarter. Who in those coaches that you found early on and that helped you develop your, maybe your broader vision and understanding of CrossFit and all the components that are necessary in order to have a, a complete and let's say valid program, who are your biggest influences, you know, coming up and who did you learn from the most as a coach? Um, the most I think I learned from a local weightlifting coach over there. He also coached um, a little bit, a few athletes on a little bit higher level. And he said a very easy sentence to me. He's like, dude, let's take a little bit, like, let's take a step and make this whole problem you're having a little bit easier so that you can understand what's happening at the moment. A disc prolapse in weightlifting is tearing your ACL in soccer. Everyone who tears his ACL in soccer, they all came back and are still playing very good soccer. All those pro athletes, all pro players, they're coming back and they're probably even better. And the, the, the injured side of their, of their body, the injured knee, is even better than the healthy one because they started to accessory on that one and super stable. Mm. That blew my mind where I was like, okay, wait a second. You're telling me I have a disc prolapse and I can get back to being a pro athlete, not pro athlete, but like getting back to my old level. And mm. I just snatched 130 one week ago and nice. I have zero back pain, nothing. So that blew my mind where I was like, okay, I love the way you're approaching this problem because I just, I saw the end result never being, because I went to doctors and everyone back in the days was not educated with this prolapse to the doctors that I went. They were like, it's fucked up. You will never be able to squat. You will never be able to move heavier weight, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we all know that. We mm. all know those um, like statements from doctors. And then going to that coach and he's telling me like, wait a second, this is super simple. You have an injury. Let's work towards getting it away. And this whole getting it away for me was like, okay, tell me literally everything that you know. So he was one of the people that I basically enjoyed working uh, with a lot. There were a few, I'm into basketball and I'm into NBA. So there were a few, um, I'm super bad with names. There were a few coaches that are training um, back in the days, the personal coach from Dwayne Wade and LeBron James. Mm -hmm. They were on certain podcasts, so I listened to what they were saying. Then what the um, West Side Barbell, um, mm -hmm. uh, how is he called? Louis Simmons. Louis Simmons. Hey, Louis Simmons is a freaking brain. I listened to almost everything that he's doing, and I love the way he's approaching things because he, he's a little... He's, he seems a little, I'm German, and he's a little bit German at some point, where it's like, <laughs> you have that issue, this is what you need to do, bam, 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 and then you get it away. This is, I love it. Perfect. Ah! Oh. And, um, but still, <laughs> the way he approaches the problem and he makes athletes feel that you can actually fix it, I love it. Then there was, um, back in the days, I listened, obviously, to a few um, podcasts of um, good CrossFit coaches back in the days, still good coaches. Chris Bieler was also one of the, uh, mm -hmm. one of the people. I mean, he's, he was, back in the days, he was an athlete. I love the way he's yeah. approaching intensity. There's a, there, I can send it to you afterwards. Maybe you want to put the link below in sure. your podcast. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a text that he wrote where he approaches the whole CrossFit community and it's like, okay, guys, all of you guys are chasing us as pro athletes, but we are pro athletes. We have enough time. We can trigger, we can plan our whole day with eating, sleeping, training, recovery, food, and you're having a 40 hour job and then you're still following our programming. This is, this cannot, this cannot work out. This is yeah. simple math. You will get fucked up along. Even us as pro athletes who can tweak everything, we still feel super down at some point. We have some knee pain, shoulder pain whatsoever. And you're doing that on top of a 40 hour job. This is difficult. Um, I always loved the way that Rich Roney was training. And mm -hmm. back in the days um, when Lindy Barber, um, she was a sponsored athlete by Foodspring, the, the, when I worked for Foodspring, and she offered me to come to um, CrossFit Mayhem to train for a week with their team. And I was like, are you like, 
typing already over on my laptop to find like flight tickets. I was like, are you serious? Is this real? You're just, yeah, just book it. And it's booked. So two weeks later, I was in Mayhem and training with him was just mind blowing to me. I was already following the way he was training during, mm -hmm. throughout my injury, but the way he trains is great because um, quite often, or like not quite often, most of the times he feels he looks how his body feels and he adapts his training to that. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we as athletes cannot really do these days. They see a programming and it's, it's, it, you feel garbage. You feel like garbage, but you read the program and it's like, oh my gosh, this programming for today will make me feel even worse. And then saying like, I'm taking this 30% off intensity. Off. I mean, I still do what's on the paper, mm -hmm. but I take 30, maybe even 40% of intensity off because this is how my body feels. And this is something that we need to learn. Adrian Moonweiler, uh, a close friend of mine, mm. love what he's doing. It is always super great because what I love doing is I love taking friends of mine or like athletes of mine with me when I visit him to just show them how he's training. Mm. Because my, my sister, she's, she wants to be a pro athlete and we're working towards that fact. So um, I'm also doing content creation. So I had to go there for a weekend and had to shoot photos and videos for Adrian. But obviously he needs to train in between. And then she came with me. And then when we drove back, she was like, and this is how he's training. And I was like, yes, this is how he's training. He trains the way he feels like. If he feels garbage, he puts in a rest day. If he feels good, he maybe even boosts the intensity. He works so much on accessories and stuff and the way he thinks he also listens to a lot of the west side Balba stuff and um this is just great to see how people train and how people listen to their body and individual body individual intensity is something that people still need to learn because it's not about three two one go being exhausted um uh, after the session and laying in the corner actually needs to implement oxygen into your body to get a, a good recovery but to answer your question it was definitely the weightlifting coach that i had back in the days mm -hmm. it was definitely um someone like chris Spieler and West, especially Westside side barber i mean i obviously read back in the days the books from carl Pauli, this red book about movements i read the stuff from uh, what's the name of this dude uh he did the mobility what stuff Kelly back Starrett. in the day Kelly Starrett. Um, because on the mobility aspect of things, because I was super stiff from playing basketball, that helped me a lot. And mm. his podcast and his approach was also mm. really great. Not sure. And I don't know why he just went off the grid at some point. I feel like he's, uh, I, I saw him pop back up somewhere. I saw, I saw him pop up again and it was adjacent to what he was doing before. It wasn't the mobility wad thing directly. I, I, I can't remember where I saw him, but. And it was part of some other organization that I follow. I forget exactly which one. Maybe yeah. someone will remember. I can put that in the comments for the podcast. Yeah. But since you were you were talking about you know training with games athletes, you train with Froning. Uh, I know you train with with many other people at that level as well. What what are the the main things that you see those people doing? What are they doing that maybe the general public doesn't see, it doesn't understand, and what? essentially allows them to, to evolve at that level, uh, but that we don't maybe think about when we think about, hey, those, those guys are, are you know, pro athletes and they, they train three or four times a day and that's all they do. But what, what, what yeah. do they do exactly? I mean, I cannot give out the main recipe so that everyone can just copy and paste it and like, no, exactly. Uh, yeah. You're later there, they're, they're in games athlete. What I can tell you right now is pretty much everyone trains completely different. They all understood what it means to listen to their body. Mm -hmm. They all understood. I was training with Yonikovsky at some point, and he's obviously a very good swimmer. So we went to the gym, and he, he felt like he's getting, maybe he's getting sick, and he started swimming, and he felt like he cannot catch his breath the way he usually uh, can catch his breath during training, during the swim session. All of a sudden, I'm swimming, and then I'm, I remember like, He's no, no, no longer passing me. Like, I don't, my swimming got so much better. And I'm like on turbo mode, but this cannot be. He must sitting on the, on the out because I'm not the best swimmer. So um, he must be sitting somewhere and it's not in the, in the pool anymore. So I stopped and I looked and then he was just leaving. It was like, Yanni, what's going on? I was like, ah, I feel like I'm getting sick. I just stopped training here. And this just blew my mind because so often in training, I was like, ah, this feels a little bit weird. Ah, me. Maybe I have a little bit of coughing and uh, like um, a feeling like having a cold-ish. Still kept training. These people, they stopped training because they're 
I don't want to say afraid, but they know if they just fuck it up right now, the consequences of potentially being out for several days is something that's a total no-go for them. Mm. And this is just so great. And that just blew it. And this happened along the way when I trained with people like Pat Vell or Yonikowski, Adrian. When I was in, uh, at CrossFit Mayhem, when I trained with the whole team, at some point, one of their athletes just didn't show up. And then uh, actually returning, asked me to join their team training. I was like, oh my gosh. Like, I actually wanted to have like a normal training session, but all of a sudden my heart rate was just up to the roof because I didn't want to disappoint anyone. But they put me in the team. I was like, why? Why is, I don't know who was missing back in this. It's like, yeah, the, that one dude feels like he's getting sick. So he's taking a rest day. That's an unwritten rule. I have the feeling for all those athletes. And this is something when I got to experience that, that's something I'm pushing in my programming, in my way of coaching to people, listen to your freaking body. You just have one. And mm -hmm. instead of just pushing it one time too hard and then having the several days of, of not training at all, this mm -hmm. is, this is the way to go. And then, yeah, it's super hard because People work differently. Adrian is a guy, he likes to do a lot of accessory. He likes to do a lot of global gym style training. He showed, he brought me into this whole moving heavy weight, odd object stuff. So I trained two times with him doing like freakingly heavy single arm dumbbell snatches. And he has this 96 kilo kettlebell and he's doing swings with it. And I was like, yeah, come on. How often are you actually moving that thing? It's like three to four times per week. I was like, are you serious? So we did it few, uh, two to three times in that time where I was training there. And I felt a, such a massive benefit to my body. So I was like, okay, this unilateral training at some point, maybe I was missing that a little bit. So I'm starting to implement that into my training and my programming mm. at the moment while talking to him and then listening also to um, Louis Simmons as well talks about that as well, unilateral training. And then he's talking about Adrian, top set, top 10 in the game, in the world in CrossFit mm. is doing it. There must be some truth to it. So I, I, what I'm then doing always, I'm practicing in a few weeks on my own body because I know I'm very good with listening to my body. When something hurts, I stop. But I, heard, I learned it the hard way with three injuries. So I use it. I'll try it. If I feel very good, then I'm implementing it into my coaching into my programming and but this is what all these athletes are doing they're listening to their own body they rest enough they eat enough and eating is, i'm still super bad with eating i'm so happy that a company just approached me who's doing these meals and glasses so my lunch was always terrible and i'm so happy that i have them now it's, it's in the microwave and it has 600 calories i'm just eating it it takes me three minutes to do it but because of the all the stuff i'm doing i'm just not good with taking food in Mm. and uh, recovery resting they rest when they have to they put in resting days and then they do nothing when they do active oh this is a good topic active recovery you see those people posting on instagram I've the, uh, okay today's active recovery 40 minute e-bomb first minute 12 burpees over the lower <laughs> second minute 15 to 16 calories rowing and i look at that training i was like even even in a full-on session i couldn't do that and you think this is active recovery uh -huh. I had, a, I had a very long, very productive discussion with a few of my athletes where I, I didn't, I don't want to say I got mad, but I, I switched my tone to be like, either you do this, dude, or we have a problem. Because for me, active recovery, you sit on a rower, you have your heart, you have your heart rate machine on, and you check that your heart rate is never going over 132 to 135 beats per minute. Mm. And then these people sitting so slow on the bikes and they feel like they're not doing anything, but it is so beneficial for your heart. For your, your heart is also a muscle, your mm -hmm. system. Having for 30, 45, maybe even 60 minutes, having a constant blood flow in your system just refreshes everything. And this is something they know. I know like Patrick Browner, for example, I think it was when he came to Berlin at some point and he felt like, okay, I just do an active recovery session today when everyone else was training. He was sitting on the bike for 60 minutes. He was just sitting there, I think heart rate between 120 to 130. And the day after, he felt so great. He could do everything. His jet lag was not too bad. Mm -hmm. And this along the way with training all those people made me realize, okay, we just all need to take a step back. We need to interpret, interpretate what we get as a programming to adapt it to our own intensity, to our own level. Mm -hmm. And this is something I learned from all these athletes along the way. And this is something they can do up to perfection. I mean, look at someone like Rich Froney. And I know he had some knee issues two years ago uh, where 
it was really bad. And also, like, Adrian had some shoulder problems. I mean, Yone had to fight his way back because he was... All, that's also something. I think also Yone is one of these athletes who learned it the hard way. He had some massive pain in his knee, and mm. he still did the regionals. And now let's have a competition environment and put the stress of the regionals on top to qualify for the games, and then there's a pistol workout with knee problems. Ciao. That's why he fucked up his knee. And mm-hmm. then, but his passion and his, obviously it was very hard and mental, mentally speaking hard for him to deal with, but still, he fought through it. He knew he needed to take deep squats out of his training. He needs to give his knee some rest, but he still kept on training. It took him one and a half to two years. And now look at him. He almost qualified to the top five um, who are now doing the, the CrossFit Games this weekend. Mm-hmm. And he, talking to him right now, it made him better as an, as an athlete. And this is what I learned from all those people. And this is where I took my, um, I don't know if you can say that in any quintessence, like the Quint- everything which... Go, like, quint- yeah, my... The, I think yeah, quintessential the, the, is a word. I, I, it might yeah. be, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, let's have it like this. Like, up below the line, yeah. your own body, your intensity, mm. your training, mm. your constant progress, train smart, work out smarter. That's, that's, the reason why I prob- that's the reason why I took that slogan for my, for my programming. Because if you're able to train smart, you can then work out even smarter and guarantee constant progress. And that's what people want. Let's, and it's let's, hard to do. Let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the package. So that's the online program that you yeah. run. You're actually wearing the t-shirt yeah. right now. Um, yeah. So Boom. here you go. Why, why, did you, <laughs> why did you start it? And what kind of principles did you use to guide the creation of this program? Yeah. So when I had my back injury and I came back and I realized, okay, now I can start doing the programming again. My body is ready to move again. I started Invictus at some point and I did the outdoor programming, then I did the training plan, I did comp training, and all those programmings, I mean, I didn't hop week by week, but I did it for a few months and I always felt like, hmm, it makes me better as an athlete, me, uh, me individual, me as a person, not mm. everyone in general, because I have I had some capacity to take intensity. But then when I like reflected how my body feels in that training. And when I see and know how many other people's without sounding arrogant or egoistic, I knew I'm better than a few, like a lot of these other people's because mm-hmm. I'm competing yeah. and I see they're doing the same stuff as me. I was like, Oh, well, these people hopefully will not get fucked up along the way. And I had that through all those the different programs because then I was interested in like, okay, I think I started with Invictus back in the day. So I was like, okay, this is not giving me the feeling that this programming is easily adaptable to every one person mm-hmm. on an individual intensity level. So I checked the next one, I checked the next one, checked the next one. And then at some point I was like, I worked for Foodspring back in the days. I had lots of great contacts. I had a lot of athletes that I talked to because I was also in charge of managing all the, uh, all the athletes, ambassadors, and games athletes there. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I know around 20 people that are not following any programming at the moment. So I was like, hmm, under the line, everyone misses out this train smart workout smarter part. This like ev- be able to read the programming for your body, for your intensity so that you can train without getting fucked up. So mm-hmm. I was like, contacted those 20 to 30 people 20 people said like awesome yes i can I, i'm definitely testing your programming so i started putting everything into a programming and then along the way without even asking for feedback they're like this is so much different to what i used to do this is cool this is great i love the fact that and i wasn't perfect back in the day so it was like i started two years ago and i took the step of being a freelancer now and just being a coach and everything mm-hmm. this february so i coached quit my job at food spring and um at the beginning it was not perfect and that's the reason why i had a better face and i tell, told everyone please 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 give me all the feedback that you have that that i need to make this project the best possible and i'm still adapting things mm. and, but i already got feedback like this feels great i don't feel exhausted anymore so, so much and then like Back in the days, I had to lift five times heavy per week. Now I'm just lifting twice because I know Monday and Tuesday is kind of like the barbell heavy-ish day. Mm. And then we work specifically on gymnastics on Thursdays. Conditioning. Wow, we're doing conditioning on Tuesday, uh, on Wednesdays with a heart rate monitor. And I feel actually, it was super weird for everyone to start working at the beginning of zone four because everyone texted me back like, hey, Pac, I have an issue. I think my body's incapable of training in zone four. I was like, your body is definitely able to do that. You just need to slow down and tell that little ego freak in your head 
to just calm down mm -hmm. and just instead of running a 13 kilometer, uh, kilometers per hour pace, maybe run a nine kilometer per hour pace, which feels super slow to you. Then they started doing it. It's like, oh yeah, well, that, that's actually working. I feel so much better. And it felt like a conditioning training, not a 45 minute zone five knock you out programming uh, session. And um, yeah, that was, that was, I actually, what was the question again? I'm always like, it was, it was talking. talk about, it was talk about the, the package. Talk about okay, the, okay. yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I, yeah. And then I kind of, it felt like um, I'm getting a part of the puzzle here, took it, put it in, took another p p puzzle piece here, put everything together. And now these days when people approach me and people contact me, I'm not doing lots of marketing. My sister, who is kind of like my right hand, who always sees the red line and helps me with this administrative stuff and all the kind of things. She always like, annoys me. It's like, you need to be more present on the Instagram and blah, and to do a lot more marketing. But I love the fact that these days or at the moment, people come through recommendation. Mm -hmm. So already someone told them, when you work with PAC, it feels very good for you as an athlete because it matches your body, your level, and your intensity. Mm -hmm. And then when I talk to everyone, I tell them like, if you work with me, get something that can measure your heart rate. Even mm. if it's just this little, stu I mean, I don't like these uh, infrared measurement things because I think they're 10 to 20% off, but mm. still it gives you at least some sort of line to work towards and some sort of result. Mm. And I tell them like it's 80 euros, get a Garmin or a Polar, whatever heart rate monitor you can connect it to any smartphone these days you don't even need the 300 euro watch right. get it because you need it you will read it so often in my programming mm -hmm. and then i started to have elite athletes for example one of the athletes is Moritz Fiebig. he was he almost already almost qualified for the crossfit games in uh, as a fitness in germany two years ago mm -hmm. and approaching was like hey i had a coach it was great but um uh, then I stopped working with him. I always had a little pain here and there. And it didn't felt like correct for me because intensity wise, it was sometimes not enough, sometimes too much. And it felt, I, I just, I'm not happy. So I heard the way you're working. Let me try it. I want to see it. And ever since we're doing that, it's so great to see someone like he's really fit. The other day we just did friendly friend and he did it in four minute 20. And I was just standing there. I was like, uh, wait a second. Let me check what they did at the games. And they was like, oh, well, this would have been place 12, I think, from right. the top 20. It was like, okay, now we're talking. And, um, but still, he was an elite athlete and his brain was so fucked up. And still today, I see him doing stuff on Instagram. And I call him, I was like, dude, did your ego just went through with you a little bit again? I was like, yeah, I'm sorry. He and also elite athletes who have a coach and work with other people still do too much. Mm -hmm. When I program a week for him, I put all the intensity and resting and pausing and accessory and heavy lifting and weightlifting, barber cycling into the week so that it works out for him. But still sometimes because people are used to, I was used to that as well, all in, all out every day in the gym and pulling people back because we are having a long-term goal and this is not a, um, achieved in one or two weeks it's achieved within my sister for example she wants to be an elite athlete and I told her you want to do that we can do that i need the next three to four years of uh, of your life Other, otherwise we cannot i cannot make you that fit in six it's literally impossible mm -hmm. same thing i told to moritz you want to go to the games okay this is going to be a long-term project we need to uh, at least you're on a very very high, very high level but still i think we need another two years to fix a lot of stuff to make you work towards that. And this again brings this, my methodology again up, even with elite athletes, they have an individual programming, uh, in, individual intensity, into, uh, individual way of training. And when they read a programming and when they see a programming, they need to understand how it works for them. Mm -hmm. So if you, for example, would start working with me tomorrow, it would take you one or two or three days to realize, okay, this is how the program is actually working. You would have a heart rate monitor. You would read all my tips, which I have in true coach. It, it says like, okay, this is for time, but not intensity. Then in the next step I'm writing, not for intensity means it should be 60 to 70%. So you should be able to catch a breath within a few seconds, blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. I have to do that so that people understand, okay, my coach thought about it. 
it's not in my responsibility to, 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 to take the decision, okay, how much resting should I do? Because it's written here. Mm. And then I have a heart rate monitor on, which says like, oh my gosh, I'm running towards zone five. My coach doesn't like that. Okay, I need to take back my pace. And when you start doing that, you feel so much more relieved. It feels very good for your body and you're still seeing constant progress. Kevin Winkins is a good example. He is, he is one of the fittest in Germany um, throughout the last years. And then actually at some point he approached me and was like, I want to do your programming. And I still, until this, this, this day, I'm like, yeah, but you're already that good. Maybe, maybe there's another, why, why do you want to work with me? It's like, I have, have good recommendations and I love the way you're approaching this whole topic. And I'm following a programming at the moment and it makes me feel super tired. I'm pretty much lifting every day. I'm touching a barbell in my opinion way too often because let's be honest, I'm writing a CrossFit programming. My programming is not a weightlifting programming or a strength strength programming. It's not a running programming. Yes, we specifically work in few phases more on this and more on that, but in general, it's a CrossFit programming. He started working with me and then he looks at the first week of the program and is like, are you sure I should just lift twice per week? Shift doesn't feel right. I was like, dude, let's have it test it for two months. Okay. You're a pro athlete. Usually I just have two weeks of people testing my program. Mm -hmm. Ah, by the way, I have a, a surprise for you guys. Everyone who's listening oh. to tap podcast. Um, when you go to my webpage, you can uh, sign up for the free trial and then you can click got to know through an athlete Instagram recommendation. And I will add your podcast. And if someone clicks that answer instead of two weeks, he's getting four weeks of free training. So you can test my programming for a full month. That's awesome. So, man. Thanks a lot. Yeah, just to give something back to your to your follower base. I appreciate that. And yeah, so I gave two months to him. Nice. And then after two months, um, he was having a testing week. And then all of a sudden, he increased his snatch, uh, his, he increased his squat clean, which was the same over the last two years by five kilograms. And when you already, I think he lifted, was it 160 or 155? Oh, I'm not sure. Let's say it's 155 to be on the shore side. He's very small. He weighs, I think, 75 to 80 kilograms. Okay, or let's say yeah. 80 kilograms. So he's not. Pretty so light. 150 is a decent number for him. Mm -hmm. And so we are already working towards the maximum he, his body is probably able of moving as a mm -hmm. crossfitter. And then adding five kilograms on your lift is mm -hmm. actually massive. If you look mm -hmm. at pro weightlifters, they are happy uh, if they can increase their lift by one or two kilograms after a season. Yeah. One or two kilograms. This is just insane. And he increased it by five kilograms. Obviously, he's a CrossFitter. But then he was, okay, you got me hooked. Let's do this. I feel good. I sleep better. I don't feel overwhelmed. I love the fact that I don't need to touch a barbell five times per week because I also love doing all the other stuff like this gymnastics, working with dumbbells, working with high skill movements and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he got hooked. And ever since, my programming is... Um, running really well it's not like i have millions of people contacting me every day but i have constant increase of people and i actually like that because i have an individual contact to everyone i'm contacting each and every person that comes to me mm -hmm. um they are all in a whatsapp group so we are exchanging videos i'm on quite often sending a selfie video into the programming because if we have a, a deal oh deload week we need to touch that topic quickly deload week is probably one of the funniest thing that i have in my programming because everyone knows about it. Everyone thinks he's doing it, but I would say eight out of nine, eight out, eight out of 10 people are not really doing a deload week <laughs> to me. If we, so for me, it's always eight weeks. So we're building up in eight weeks and then we have a deload week and a deload week for me means two days of your week is zero, nothing, nada, niente. You're doing nothing at all. Usually in my programming, we have two days off. And at that one off day, sometimes I give them do a little bit of recovery training, like swimming or like running on a very low pace or do mobility, do yoga whatsoever. But on a deload week, there's two days of doing nothing at all. And on the usually active recovery day, I maximum allow them to do mobility. So it's actually another rest day. Right. So they have three rest days. And in this very fast environment and in everything that is happening on Instagram and everywhere where people think like they need to train way more than they're actually doing, putting people now on a deload week is like, this freaks me out. I cannot do that. This is just driving me nuts. So 
fuck, I can't, no, 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 no. Three days of not training. And then I see, because I obviously follow all those people on Instagram as well, and I see them doing something that is not in my program. I was like, <laughs> could it be that your third rest day ended up being a friend session with someone else? Yeah, sorry, I'm packed, but I felt so good. And uh, I wanted to train and blah. And I was like, see, you, you, let's have it like this. I don't want it says it, it sounds hard. Fucked it up this time because yeah. now it is, let's say the sixth day of the week and your body starts to feel really good. Just imagine how good your body would feel if we have another 24 hours of giving your system and your body and especially your nerve system more rest. Mm. Your, your body can just adapt while doing nothing, while resting. We need that. Your system needs to be able to calm down at some point. Mm -hmm. And then he looks at me and he's like, yeah, well, that's actually correct, but I've never said that before. And that, that's the reason why we're doing the deload week. And now having someone like Kevin Winkins with me, who is a pro athlete to all those people, and he's like putting a selfie video into the WhatsApp group. It's like, hey, dudes, hey, guys, I'm doing deload. I'm so happy that I have three days off. And on my third rest day, honestly, you know what I will do? I'll get my Ben and Jerry's. I will sit on the couch and I just play whatever, PlayStation, just walk around with my dog, do all the stuff that I can actually not do when training so much. Mm -hmm. And then people finally start to realize what a deload week is. And now that people are doing it, they're like, this deload stuff is actually quite fun. This is actually quite good. And the next thing I'm doing is my deload week, 90% of the time looks completely similar. So if you will work with me and it would be deload, you, you know how the deload week looks like. And I mean like what it looks like, the actual movements and what is coming when throughout the, throughout the week, because I want to make it easier for people to recreate the same feeling in every deload week. Sometimes mm -hmm. I just adapt one or two things, just minor things, but in general, it's the same deload week so that everyone is, ah, I did that deload week three times already. I know how that session should feel like. Mm -hmm. I know that I fucked up this session, even though he said it should be 60%. I probably did 80% and last time I felt a little bit exhausted. So I know I needed to put my intensity down. Just giving people more, like, more possibilities to understand how each session should feel like. Mm -hmm. So that in the end, under the line, they're like, check. I did a deload week and then, oh, hell yeah, let's get to the next phase of the training and just crush it. What are some of the, maybe through time, the, can you talk about the evolution of your programming through the pack and maybe the common mistakes that you did early on in programming CrossFit, um, CrossFit programs yeah. and yeah. maybe mistakes that you still see coaches do today? Yeah. So one of the bigger mistakes I would say at the beginning was I thought, okay, I know pretty much what I want to do. So let's write it down and let's make people do that. And then they text me in the first one or two weeks, like pack, if you want to continue like this, this is not going to work out. I was like, why? Your sessions just take three hours. Because sometimes when I was writing it, I was like, ah, that sounds like I can do it in 90 minutes easily. So I realized, okay, wait a second. Maybe just because I'm very effective in the gym and uh, because I mainly train alone or with my sister. And we know when it's training, it's training. It's not chit-chatting and stuff like this because I want to get the shit done. We can't do mm. chit-chatting afterwards. So I realized, okay, and I just tested just a few things because I'm usually very good because I also did pro, I, I'm, I wrote the programming for a, comp, a competition called Swiss Alpine Battle. So mm. I'm, I was already good with doing programming, but this was just always just one workout. It was not a programming. So I realized along the way, okay, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Maybe I need to take a little bit of a step back for me and my training, and I need to test a lot more things. I need to test how does this feel like in combination with this? How long is this going to take me in the programming? And along the way with the feedback I got from the first 20 people, and I'm very thankful to all of these people, I learned now these days, I can write you a programming, I can, I can write you a session that takes 90 minutes. I can also write you a session that takes three hours. But this is just something I had to learn. Also along the way, because of my injuries and because of what I did in the past, I know where and how to put certain intensities and how to put certain volumes, talking about weight especially, how mm -hmm. heavy you should move stuff, mm -hmm. and how your system is probably going to react to that. 
that's also something that throughout my athlete career I had to learn and I learned the hard way. And I then had also learned, I also had to learn to implement that into the training. And this is also something I had to get with exchange from people. Like when you have 20 people trying the programming, that's already fairly a lot. And these 20 people are all different. There's very light people, there's skinny people, there's muscular people, there's older athletes, there's younger athletes. And the average out of everything made me realize how to put intensity and where to put what kind of stuff. Mm. And then, yeah, again, still working with people, listening. I also showed my programming to pro athletes and then they're like, tell me what you think. I showed it to Adrian. Quite often, sometimes I'm sitting down with him. It's like, hey, how would you do that? How would you do that? I see you doing this. Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that in that certain order? And all that kind of stuff just floats into my programming and I still think it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. I still think we can still improve a lot of stuff. And, but I think under the line, I created something that is very good for every athlete. I have three different levels. I have the generic, which is for people who did a competition already, a smaller one who want to do a little bit more, don't have that much time, can only Mm -hmm. train five times per week. Then I have something that is called the magic power programming because Kevin is called got the magic power on Instagram. So I call it the magic power programming because it's basically what I would program for someone like him, Mm -hmm. a pro athlete. This, and you can buy this programming in two versions, which is the standard, which is just five sessions per week again, but each session is longer. It has more intensity and more volume for someone who already competes on a regular basis. And then I have the Magic Power Pro version, which is like someone who is really um, moving towards, or like who is a pro athlete, who wants mm-hmm. a programming, and this is eight to nine sessions per week, and that kind of stuff. And along the way, with all the stuff that people gave me as feedback and what I had um, experienced uh, through my own um, way of being an athlete and injuries and whatsoever that helped me developing the programming. So maybe a good time to, to fit in a, an audience question. Guillaume asked how to best organize a week of training in CrossFit. So maybe if you could give the rough outline of maybe your generic version to, to give an idea yeah. to people, how you organize it, how much weightlifting is there, how much gymnastics, yeah. how much more structural, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so what I realized quite, uh, quite fast is that people, move heavier ish weights the best when they come out of some sort of rest is so mm-hmm. um let's start on a saturday because saturday is what i would say in the week the most intense day I, i'm having because i want people to enjoy crossfit and how can you enjoy crossfit the best when you're doing crossfit workouts so you want to go there you want to have this feeling beep three two one go okay just let just go so on saturdays there's either one long workout and one short workout or three medium workouts and mostly uh, and most likely a little bit of core stuff mm-hmm. core stability and accessory is a massive part of my program i know and to all the people that are listening to your programming and uh, to your uh, to your audience i know it's boring i know it sucks no one wants to do it it's stupid yeah fuck that um, you need to beat that one. <laughs> you no, have no, you to can, do it. You can, you can fucking swear. That's fine. Okay. You have to do it. And people in my programming, they do it and they see so much benefit. This just on the side, because this is a very crucial part of my programming. So Saturday is fairly intense. Mm. So people appreciate the uh, their rest day on Sunday. But still, then the system is still a little bit on fire. I, I don't want to say on fire because it sounds wrong. It's ready. Ready is the better word. So the system is still ready because they came out of a rest day and the day before was a lot of like workouts, which was high intensity. And then I realized, okay, when I put weightlifting on Monday and Tuesdays, they are actually moving fairly good. The system feels like it awakes way faster. It mm. is um, the body moves faster and we are literally talking about speed, getting mm-hmm. the bar and that kind of stuff. And they're very good in, in moving more volume. So Mondays and Tuesday, I put this into the programming. Then on Wednesdays, to take this whole intensity that we have, in, uh, to, to take this a little bit away from the body, I have conditioning. I have t- it's a typical CrossFit um, uh, conditioning with where we have intervals with working on resting. Then let's say last week we had a three minute 30 on, three minute 30 off, typical CrossFit movements. You have to work beginning of zone four, maximum mid of zone four in the three minute 30 active part. And then in the three minute 30, each round, you need to look on your watch, count the seconds, how long it takes your heart rate to go back down into zone two, just to see how fast can your system actually adapt. And then Mm -hmm. 
um, and then you record all of that and this data and put it into your app and this training because it's just maximum zone mid of zone four but actually beginning of zone four mm. is lower intensity which then is good for the body then on thursdays is always a rest day and this is the rest day where um sometimes i tell people to do a little bit of yoga maybe go for a fast-ish walk but never go high with your heart rate mm. um on then the next would be a lot of monostructure work is coming in then when it comes to gymnastics i'm a huge fan of strict pulling i'm a huge fan of strict isolated work i'm doing my people are doing biceps curls triceps extensions all these kind of things and i love it and you know what people love posting that on it and uh, it, has a, it has a lot of benefit to your training so thursdays is is um, gymnastics, um, uh, no, sorry, Friday gymnastics because Thursday is off. And then Saturday we have the workout week, uh, the workout day. Mm -hmm. So this is basically how I plan my week. Mm -hmm. Again, I have a community. I have the package family. Um, there will be, we will all do the open, for example. And then when we work towards the open, we obviously take a little bit, we take away a lot of like heavy squatting and that kind of stuff to work the body more towards being able to perform in, in a crossfit type of workout, in a qualifier mm -hmm. workout. We mm -hmm. also, when we get to open in January, we will, um, we will run a simulation. So I will actually switch my whole week. Mm. So that it feels like an open week so that people know, okay, on Wednesdays is always off. Thursday, the workout comes out. I'm doing it for the first time. Friday, normal session, Saturday off. Like we will, I think it was one day off. It doesn't matter. I just, I just plan it how to hope, like a, how, um, I'll take an open week mm. and I'll plan my week according to that before the open actually starts so that people got a hang of the rhythm. Because let's be honest, this five weeks, even though you're just doing it for fun, is super stressful for everyone. Mm. And if they're already good with the fact that this is how my week looks like because we did it the last five weeks already with not the pressure of performing super well, um, just training makes people feel a lot more comfortable throughout the open. After the open, obviously we need to get back up our lifting a little bit more. We get up, um, people maybe feel exhausted from those five weeks. Then we, we definitely will have one or two weeks, which are super low, just moving. Then we go into a little bit more weight based training. So a lot more monostructural squatting, strict pulling and that kind of stuff comes to work comes more into the programming mm -hmm. but then again i want to switch fairly fast i would say after two to three months want to switch back to my typical crossfit style workout uh, crossfit style week mm -hmm. because that's what we then will use until the next open preparation is starting yeah so talking about the open talking about competitions in your mind how have crossfit competitions evolved over time whether it's at the amateur level locally uh, at the at the high level can you talk a little bit about your yeah, sure. point of view on competitions in general yeah back in the days when you had a 100 kilogram snatch you were the hero on the competition floor mm -hmm. 100 kilogram snatch doesn't make you qualify for any higher competition me with my 130 snatch i would have i think that yeah, with 130 kilograms, I would not have been the top three at the German throwdown last year. Mm -hmm. and this is insane. And we're talking about the German throwdown, not the sanctioned German throwdown, not any other sanctioned event. But with 130 kilograms, you're not really that crazy, that crazy good. So this is just crazy to see how the, like just the general level. It was here five years ago mm -hmm. and now it's here. So you need to have at least a 125 or 120 snatch to actually be able to be on a competitive level-ish to qualify. Your condition needs to be good. Your moving and crossfit movements needs to be good. This is just insane how the average level just went up. Back in the days, you came for a fairly high level sport mm -hmm. to crossfit. Give me four weeks. I'll show you all of the movements. We can make you to competitive athletes within a blink of a second. It's my sister. Good example. She was always very strong, used to dance ballet. So her core and her legs and everything was super heavy, uh, super strong. She can easily squat over hundred kilograms. We had that within two months, uh, within a half, uh, sorry, two months, it was too fast. Uh, within half year of training, easily over hundred kilograms, which is very good for women. Mm. Her pulling strength was not the best, but we fixed almost all of the movements now. So she can do everything. Back in the days, when we started CrossFit, she would have been easily one of the athletes in a competition who would qualify for the finals in a competition. These days, she's 
away from qualifying to the elite category. Mm -hmm. So now these days, because people realize that the average level is getting so good and we are losing all those people below here who are not elite yet. They are x or maybe scaled. This is something I love. The first year it came out, I was like, fuck that, come on, let's just do elite. These other people, I was egoistic, arrogant and whatsoever. Um, but now I know that it needs to be implemented, this, these levels of these divisions in a CrossFit competition so that we're not losing the base, the people who are below those elite athletes so mm -hmm. that they also can, can move to a competition. The movement standard has gotten so much better. People move better. Judges got so much better. The programming overall got better because back in the days, let's be honest, there were certain competitions with programmers and you look at this, you're like, ah. three out of those 30 people will survive. The others one would be just crushed after that mm. one. That got so much better. Um, like run of show, the flow. It looks, when you go to a CrossFit competition these days and then um, it feels like a proper sports event. Mm. Whereas back in the days, it it would, would not have been surprising to like go there and then your, your 30 when should have been at 4 p.m. But then it's all of a sudden at 6 p.m. Because people were just good at getting people there, but they really didn't have, a, have, a, have any clue how to run a schedule. And then right. there was, they wanted to start in heat and there was two judges missing here and all these kind of easy mistakes at the beginning because we were not educated well enough. And then mm -hmm. it, the, the, the sport was still so low and so not known that all those event directors, all those people who are doing event management were not in that game. Now, I, I would say every high-level sanctioned event had, has, has at least one or two person. They're not even doing CrossFit, but they're good at running events. Right. And this just makes every competition so much fun. You can go there as an athlete and you can rely on the schedule. You can rely on the fact that there's a good head judge. And normal, I would say almost all of the judges are good. There will be some sort of problems happening along the way. But mm -hmm. these are just minor mistakes. This is just what I love. This sport is growing so much and it's getting so professional around the world. Not only just the CrossFit Games. Right. Everywhere. And with this whole sanctioned, um, um, sanctioned events, you can have these elite, elite competitions now everywhere. And this is just something I love and makes it uh, super exciting for athletes and coaches because you can pick events, you can pick competitions. Because back in the days, it was like there was maybe three competitions, the French throwdown back in the days, and these kind of competitions, it was super hard to qualify. And then mm -hmm. qualifying for regionals, let's be honest, was barely impossible. But now there are so many competitions and the athlete can come to you and like, Pack, I want to work with you. I want to qualify for that competition. It's like, awesome. That competition fits your level perfectly mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. And it's not frustrating because back in the days, you would have told him like, you know, you've worked probably with those people. It's like, yeah, I want to make it to the CrossFit Games. I was like, yeah, let's see about that. <laughs> But now they're like, yeah, I want to make it to the CrossFit. And I want to make it to the German throw. I was like, this is a good idea. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. Let's maybe do the first year as an intermediate. And then the next year we do it elite, like the highest division. It's like, yes, let's do this. Awesome. Love it. And that's good for us. Good for us as a sport. And, and I'm always talking about the sport of CrossFit, right. not doing it as a lifestyle product to improve mm -hmm. your health. Yeah. This is sport. This is very important. Yeah, it is. Like I think you, I think you're right. Making the distinction between the methodology, the lifestyle, uh, and then the, the the sport itself it is very important. Yeah. Talking about the sport, we're in 2020. Obviously, this year the kind of the circuit has been disrupted due to COVID and and other things. So, what what is your take on this year's games? How it's been set up in terms of the qualification? What do you think of the events of round one? Uh, that they all had to do online in their own gyms. And then uh, that leads us to, I guess, tomorrow is when the, the actual game starts. So can you give us your perspective on the, those yeah. 2020 games? I'm so sad, actually, because back in the days, or in the last years, it was always this weekend in the year where you gather with your friends mm -hmm. and you were just sitting there watching the games as of Thursday until Sunday. It was just a blast every year. Uh, but nevertheless, we have COVID, which sucks big time. Um, let's be honest. I think if they would have canceled it this year, everyone would have understood it. Everyone would mm. have been fine with it. And I think it would have been the smartest idea. But with everything that got, went on in CrossFit itself and in the company with, you know, what kind of mm -hmm. issues they had, 
I can totally understand the call that they didn't want to just, okay, someone else is now in charge of it. And the first thing he's doing, he's canceling right. this one thing that everyone loves in the year. Mm -hmm. So that he tried to find a solution to give that back to the people to tell them or like to show them like, look, I really want to, I don't want to say save CrossFit because that sounded, that sounds so harsh, but to go back to where it used to be mm -hmm. and where pe everyone was super excited. But under the line, I think it should have canceled it because it would have made life a lot easier because let's be honest. I talked to Yone, for example, um, two weeks ago. So this is the thing. Let's say he would have been place five. He would have been allowed to go to the States. First of all, it would not, it would not have been easy to get there. It's like, can he actually fly there? Mm -hmm. Question one, let's say he can fly there. He has to go into quarantine for 14 days and dude let's be honest you go to the to the biggest elite competition and then you go into quarantine mm. and you just basically do burpees air squats and push-ups in <laughs> two weeks that would mean he would need to fly over there at least six to eight weeks before mm. to then come out of quarantine and then train for six weeks to be then back on the level to compete at the CrossFit Games. That means, and a lot of these athletes still have PTs, they still work, they still need to make some sort of income. Mm -hmm. It's super expensive to go to the Games to just live there for eight weeks, hotel and accommodation and that kind of stuff. And you cannot rely on your sponsors these days as you used to do in the, uh, in the past because all those sponsors, all those brands, they're not getting the same visibility to, so they, they also have budget issues with, because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So these people, they don't have like, oh, yeah, easy, I'll go fly there. I just pay those eight weeks of hotel. Just, you, don't need to take, uh, you don't need to take care of it because I get enough marketing from you because you wear my brand on your shirt here and there whatsoever. That makes it, and then a lot of people, they don't even have those sponsors. So this would have been, meant a massive thing for someone like Yone. I think... Out of the top five, everyone is from the states now. On the on the on the male side, yeah, I think there's uh, yeah. David's daughter on the on the women's side at least. And but she is uh, she lives in the states. I guess so she, she should not. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, she she should not have an issue. But this would this would mean this this is still super weird. So then he would just not fly there. I mean, he didn't qualify in the end. But if someone would have been from Europe, would he fly there? Mm -hmm. Would he not fly there? Mm -hmm. What would he? What would have he done in um uh, in that scenario? So now we had this, uh, we had this online competition, which everyone was super excited about. Why? Because everyone saw the Rogue Invitational. And let's be honest, with what they had and with what they wanted to do, they did an amazing job. It was great. I mean, it was not like watching a live stream from a normal competition. It was these split screens everywhere, but they made it so good. Mm -hmm. And I know it because I talked to Jon and Adrian, and they had, um, a, they had a technical advisor who was on calls with Rogue literally day in and day out, I think the, 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 the two weeks before the competition actually started so that they were sure everything was running well. Everyone had right. the same cameras. Everyone had the same equipment. The lines and the square is fine. And then they checked connections and everything. Then the whole competition started and everyone's like, they're doing it actually really good. Mm. It is not the same as watching a live stream, but right. at least I get a hang of it and it, uh, it feels good. So everyone was excited because they realized it can work out. Now mm. the games are happening and then we're sitting there and it's like, where is it? Where can I watch it? Like, and then even like the recaps and everything, it felt like they haven't thought it through all the way. So this whole qualification process was more like if you knew someone, you texted someone, it's like, hey, how was he doing in that workout? And that's, that was it. Uh -huh. That was the, the most information you were able to get. So this was a bummer, honestly speaking, because I think something like, the, like CrossFit HQ should have the resources to, like, to do a proper online-based competition. Again, they did something, they tried it, it was good. They have now a top five, and now they're having the, the CrossFit Games, which are coming this weekend. And I'm super excited to see how they will fix that with the live stream. I think they will mm. work a lot with Instagram and Facebook, okay. which used to work out uh, last year. So it was fairly good. It was good to watch the CrossFit Games there. So I, they have the knowledge, they have the capacity over there. Mm. Everyone is at the ranch. I love the ranch. I mean, it is... It is CrossFit was born on the ranch. Yeah. So 
they will probably have proper Wi-Fi. They will have everything set up and they have a media team over there because now uh, two of my friends, they used to work for CrossFit Media when then this whole problem started. They were kicked out of CrossFit Media. Now they're back in there. So they, they know that they need a media team. So right. I'm, I hope that it will look a lot better uh, when the actual competition is starting because they will just work with live streams and put it on Instagram. It will not be like three years ago where it was... I think, was it three years ago? I think it was the first year they were in Madison. I think this was the best year when it came to, um, to live streaming because you had the split screens, you had the wraps above there. Yeah. You had great, I mean, you had great commentary. It was so good. It was mm. super exciting. You had the feeling you're literally there. And I have the feeling that they're working the, their way back towards this, um, this performance of having a live stream. But I'm a little bit... I'm a little bit like, mm, let's see first what they will do. Mm. But I think at the ranch, they will do a way better job than the actual qualification process when they had the top 20 battling against each other. What, what did you think of the programming on the, on the first phase with the, kind of the heavy girls and then kind of the three components of CrossFit, you know, monostructural uh, weightlifting and then gymnastics, a very, very isolated, let's say, workouts what did you think of that framework that they used for the qualifications yeah i think the problem we are having here is the fact that everyone is in their gym mm. so you're not you're not doing a qualifier like regionals or like a sanctioned event where mm, the variety of movements you can do is so big you can mm -hmm. do everything mm -hmm. because you can set everything up you have judges you can put the variety in you can test so many different things with a gym scenario you just fixed up to a certain point because yes they could have done more complicated things but then they would have run into any a lot of issues like is this actually a wrap or oh, this oh, i cannot compare this to that here and there so that's the reason why i think they took a step back and yes it might seem a little bit monostructure a little bit too heavy, a little bit more favoring for people who are good. Very short heavy. too, right? If you yeah, look at very, the time domains, yeah. Very short too, because, but I think this is because of the fact that we had it here in our podcast. Let's say they would do a one hour row mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the frame freezes in the middle. This is pretty much the worst case that could happen. Yeah. A row, it freezes and then all of a sudden someone is at 22K on the rower. It freezes, it, it starts moving at, and it's 30 kilometers. Like in two minutes, you're not rowing 8K. Just, just thinking about it. You know, this yeah. could potentially happen. Right. So I think that's one of the reasons why I try, try to keep it short as well. And then the restriction with online and then yes, especially in comparison to what happened the year before at Madison, where people were like, oh, if he would have been a good runner and if he would have been good at sprinting, he would have made it to the top 20, easy, to the top 10 easily in the end. Mm. And now we're having this online qualifier where they now move back to having a lot of heavy weights and then heavy uh, um, women were like this friendly friend and all these kind of workouts. And then mm. this testing a one rep max here and there. I think a lot of people were wondering why they're doing this. Me as a coach, as a programmer, I think they did a good job. I think it was a good test. I think with what they, the possibilities they had within having everything in a gym and in an online competition, it was very well thought through. Um, did you get a chance to look at the events that were announced so far for the games? I think if I remember correctly, there's a, there's a corn sack sprint up yeah. the hill, 320 meters up the hill with a corn sack, 30 pounds for the women, 50 yeah. pounds for the guys. We got a CrossFit total on day one as well. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a toast to bar and kettlebell lunges announced as well. Uh, yesterday they announced the triple triple, I think it is, with the with the heavy snatches in kind of a speed ladder. Uh, so far from what you've seen, what do you think of those events? I love the fact that you actually gave me some information about what's happening because um, I'm building up that uh, gym here in Düsseldorf at the moment, and we had a lot of stuff happening in the last three days. I was just basically not checking anything because we've been working all day. Um, but with what you just told me, it feels like. It sounds good. I mean, everyone wants to see people dying on that hill, let's be honest, because it brings <laughs> back all those memories from Chris Beeler back in the days where he pretty much just falls up the hill instead of running it. And yeah. then when he just 
collapses over the finish line. It is a brutal workout. It is just a lag destroyer. I love it. I loved it also when they did it at the actual CrossFit Games two or three years ago. It just looked so good. And I think they can make like a good, or like visually speaking, for the viewers who are watching the live stream, I think they can make it look very well. Mm. Um, then stuff like... Stuff like that, stuff that happened also back in the, uh, I think it was two years ago when they had this weird hang, split, jerk, dumbbell, right. whatever stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, why do we need to switch movement to, it felt like they are forcing new movements into CrossFit. Mm -hmm. And it felt like, why do you have to do that? So yeah. um, when you just tell me like kettlebell, I think we never had kettlebell lunges in a, in a, in a, in a CrossFit game yeah. scenario. Let me just make sure I've got the I've got the events in front of me. Oh, here. awesome! Love it's, it. It's uh, yeah, kettlebell lunges. Um, I guess it's got to be hanging to the side because they're thirty-two kgs for the guys. So that's sixty-four kilos of of kettlebells, and it's a thirty, twenty, ten toast to bar and kettlebell lunges. Um, mm. Oh, and they're doing oh, yards. That's a, but, right. But that's a be that's a beautiful couplet. Right. I mean, this is this is uh, this is just heavily on your legs. It and would, grip. It would be very. Yeah. And grip. It would be very, yeah, it would be interesting if they either do front rake lunges because let's be honest, these people are very like fit. I think they can hold two 32 kilogram kettlebells in the front rack. But again, if you put it in your hands next to the, next to the body, it's, it's going to be a super grippy workout. Yeah. So it's, it's specialized towards people who can hold on to yeah. stuff. So yeah. that's going to be very interesting to see. And 30, 20, 10, two movements, basic couplets, you will have, you need to sprint that workout. It's just yeah. like, there is not much resting going on there. So that's something I like because it shows the mental side for people like how bad do they actually want to win. And the best example is when you look at Matt Fraser doing that friendly friend thing and he probably pro like pretty much collapses on the floor and his like legs were so shaky that he couldn't even stand. This is going to happen in this workout. And we have five people next to each other now, not mm. in a gym where you film yourself. Mm. It's super interesting. It's going to be good to see. And then that's Process on this... Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. That's on the Saturday morning. And then later there's a snatch triple. So it's a speed ladder, three bars with one, two, and three minute time caps over the three rounds. The first bars for the men are 225, 235, 245. And then okay. the next round is 45, 55, 65. And the last round is 65, 75, 85. So I think that's going to be an that's interesting gonna, one after the, that's the gonna be heavy. after the grippy yeah and after the grippy morning workout I, I think it is and just saw here I, I didn't know it was on but on the Sunday there's a hundred yard sprint hundred yard sled push hundred yard sprint and the sled is eighty for the the ladies and oh that's for the gonna men. destroy your legs <laughs> oh that's gonna be spicy for the legs you know. Let's get back to something we said at the very beginning of the podcast. We asked me what I learned from CrossFit athletes training with them. Mm -hmm. That pops up into my mind now. And there is a, there is a sequence in, a, I don't know if it, was the, if it was a documentary or a behind the scenes video, where someone interviews a friend of Rich Froning. And then what they were talking about is the fact that on the weekend, actually, Rich Froning is doing less sessions, what he would normally do in his normal environment at home in training. Yeah. So volume-wise and workout-wise per day, it is actually not more, it is the same, definitely not more. And what these athletes are doing, and I see that through all those athletes are training with, is the fact that they're doing it, they're trying to doing it up to perfection to train their body to be able to handle that amount of sessions mm -hmm. within a short period of time. And then it comes, basically it comes down to how well can your body recover? So what they, under the line, as soon as you reach certain numbers on your squats, on your liftings, on your running and whatsoever, it comes down to the fact how good can your body recover within these sessions. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why the spread at the beginning of the CrossFit Games is not that big and it feels like, oh, this is going to be an amazing CrossFit Games because everyone is so close to each other. And then towards the end, you see like, okay, this, these 80, 70% of the people did not um, per, did not learn to perfection how to recover fast and then these other people's like Matt Fraser's, Patrick Bellner's, Vikovsky's and how they are all called they are good with recovering and that's the reason why they can still keep up the level and intensity and mm -hmm. I think this is going to be interesting to see when we talk about the workouts that are happening on this weekend because we have 
a super grippy workout. We have to sprint up the hill, which is just, it's an acid party in your muscles. Again, acid party with running and sled pushing. Then CrossFit total. I mean, everyone likes to see them moving heavy weights. And then snatch ladder. Everyone loves snatch ladders. Everyone loves speed ladders. And it's going to be interesting to see because we have some fairly strong people in the, in the top five. I think that's also the reason why they maybe put a little bit more of heavy stuff in there. Hmm. Might be a guess, might be right, might be wrong. I don't know. But I think it's going to be very interesting to see the skill of those athletes. How good can they recover actually in, um, in, in training and in competition? It's, it's funny you mentioned that recovery part on the games and Castro said it as well. And, and like you said, you can see it where, you know, like, like a Fraser will start at a, at a certain level and we'll just keep that the whole way through. And you might see other people start a little bit higher, but throughout the I'm four sorry. days, <clears throat> they just can't maintain the same intensity throughout. So it is a game of volume and it is a game of recovery. It, it's interesting to me that the, if we, if we, like we talked before about making the difference between CrossFit, the sport and CrossFit, the training methodology and the lifestyle yeah. that those are, have almost gone to polar opposites when it comes to volume. If you, if you read the original CrossFit kind of idea, it is very minimalistic in its inception. It's, you don't need to do a lot. How little can you do to get what you need is really one of the foundational things of the methodology. But now the sport is, is almost the opposite where it's a volume game is how much, how much can you do without getting crushed and still get through to the yeah. other end of that? Yeah, but I think I love the fact that you're actually touching that topic. And I think that was also the reason why there was this clinch happening at some point where there's like, ah, uh, this sport side of things at CrossFit is getting too big for that certain person we are talking about right now. Mm -hmm. And this whole health and actually what I try to do with CrossFit mm -hmm. is getting pushed back into the back a little bit. Because like you said, at the beginning, it was just, it was very minimalistic. It was how much can we do in a certain time period? And now... People realize, hey, wait a second. Oh, hold on, hold on, guys. Let's whip this whole um, thing around. We can actually make a sport out of this. We can actually compare people to each other. We can actually make something so amazing and so verified uh, uh, with such a variety of mm. movements and athletes. And this is going to be epic. And then people love epic stuff. People love stuff where they see people dying. And this is, this is sometimes also very hard for box owners when they like see people Googling CrossFit and then they see these YouTube videos. And then this is always something I still don't like with CrossFit is, and it's not CrossFit's fault. It's, it's YouTube. And this is stupid people putting stupid videos up there. You know, when you have a good product, let's say Apple, for example, someone wants to buy an Apple product. Mm. I don't know if you need to beep that, but let's say, let's not take a company. We have a company. A company makes a very, very very good product and then a person wants to get the product and he knows the product is good he will buy it and then the person who's selling the product can talk about the benefits and everything that is good and this this whole talk right from the start the seller and the, and the consumer is getting into interaction is a very positive thing let's turn it the other way around now we're trying to sell crossfit in i would say five to six times out of ten people approach us who are selling or like who are giving this product to the people and they're like, ah, what you're doing is wrong. Wrong. This is weird. This is look at the back of this person. So the start of the talk is not as positive as the company with the great product. It is mm -hmm. very negative because what we need to do, we need to come, we need to convince people like what you think about this sport is probably wrong. And then you need to find five, six, seven arguments mm -hmm. to get them away from the fact that, Hey, what do you think about this sport is actually not correct. And then we are at the point and this takes a lot of energy and that we're, nice. then we're at the point where the other companies right from the start, this is still something that annoys me with CrossFit, but this, this is just how this whole thing is working. And I think if we will get rid of it at some point, I don't know, hopefully, yes. Um, but this is just human beings who are just putting stupid stuff online. Can you talk to us a little bit about a little bit more about that performance facility that you're, that you're helping create in, in Dusseldorf and yeah. what you're trying to bring to, to market something that maybe isn't available uh, at all or not a lot <clears throat> in the environment, the current environment. What problem are you trying to solve with this? Yeah. So, mm, 
I mean, you, we talked a lot now, and I think you realize that I love coaching people who are doing this kind of um, training as a sport, as yeah. a competitive athlete. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to give a product to people who just want to get fitter for their daily life. I mean, this is still a benefit that you still get from my programming, but still competition, sport, mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about. Then with my, my, my job I had in the, in the past, I had to travel to gyms, I had to sell products, I was a competitive athlete, I have a lot of friends, I trained here and there. And I experienced it on my own. I experienced it in other gyms that is always the same. They have good athletes. They have good athletes. These athletes need to consume this product more than just one hour. They need a certain space. They need an open gym. They have their own programming. They're probably, I mean, I'm the best example. When I'm in the training zone, I look like the most arrogant motherfucker on earth. People think like, who the fuck is this dude over there? But this is just because I'm in the zone. Like, For me, this 90 minutes or two hours is just like, I want to train. Not being mean or anything, just leave me alone because I want to make the best training possible for me at the moment. Mm -hmm. And this is sometimes when people talk to me, say, you're actually quite nice. I was like, why should I not be nice? And then I'm like, <laughs> when I look at you training, I, I would never think about asking you anything because it feels like you're eating me alive so this whole this whole need athletes do have and but let's be honest every box owner needs to have members that pay his bills mm -hmm. and the easiest way to doing that is having 45 minutes to one hour sessions get as many people in there get as many classes running have as many members as possible who are in my gym the shortest amount of time and I'm delivering the best product in this time. Someone who's doing open gym, someone who's maybe looking, at, looking like me, a little bit arrogant, is there for two hours, maybe even three hours. Then people are looking at us like, who is that? Who's that dude? And then maybe he's surrounding three, four, five more people. Then they have a little community in there. This community feels not included in the main community of the gym. And I've seen it so often that these two groups fall apart because then the box owner needs to take the step in cutting the open gym or splitting the group or kicking people out. And then I have, I know a lot of gyms where smart box owners actually see the fact that having someone being competitive, having someone representing my gym with my t-shirt on a competition floor can actually be something very beneficial. Mm -hmm. But then again, on the other hand, we have a lot of pro athletes who move towards being a box owner now and then they have athletes in there who are getting towards the fact being better than the actual box owner and then there's emotions coming in i mean you know all of that mm -hmm. and this leads to the fact that we have a lot of people out there the only thing the only thing basically they need is open gym all the equipment i need mm -hmm. i need space I need to go there. It doesn't matter if I'm loud. There is no class running around. I can properly train for my competition. And I'm not, because at some point, people don't feel welcomed. I have the same issue in other gyms as well. I got kicked out of gyms because there was then issues happening because, um, because people were like, we don't need you in here. And there was a lot of miscommunication and misunderstanding. And then I'm also a very stubborn uh, German person. And then he has like, you know what, fuck that. I actually just tried to do my training in here. And I would actually love to support you and supporting a gym and representing it somewhere. Didn't work out, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. Got kicked. I mean, I, I, had, I experienced it, everything on my own. And then I saw it in other gyms. So I saw the fact that we need a product that can people give what they need. And this is open gym preparation for competitions. I want to have, that's the reason why we're building up this facility. We will most likely have a very close partnership with a hotel, which is close by. So mm. people can book in there, get cheaper prices. This whole facility is split, so we have um, 1,500 square meters where the gym where I'm in charge of will be inside. 1,000 mm -hmm. square meters is be indoor beach volleyball, and I have a 500 square meter flat surface, just CrossFit, mm -hmm. or like open gym, mm -hmm. um, because we haven't paid the affiliation yet, but this will come as well. And then crossing the, the parking area, we have a 3,000 square meter global gym, right. and in the bottom, there's a, um, we will establish that next week, there will be there will be a restaurant where they have vegetarian, vegan snacks and food. And this whole thing, I want to then also create, if let's say German Throwdown is happening in Mainz this year again, or like next year when COVID is over. And I have, a, I have, an, I have an athlete who wants to prepare. Oh, I'm getting a package. Nice. What is um, it? I don't know. If, um, just because I don't have an, like a home address yet, I'm annoying <laughs> all those people here because I'm getting packages day in and day out. Um, 
So what we want to, and then let's say there's a coach, he has four athletes and he wants to prepare those athletes and get them out of their gym environment and just focus mainly a full weekend of uh, competition preparation. We will rent that space. People can book packages. People can go in there. We have athletes who, uh, if they want to prepare for a competition, they can go in there. Mm. We have um, seminars. I'm very close with people from Concept Two, Rock Tape, um, Z Health. I don't know if you know that neurological training, which is coming uh, like a lot. I'm a, I'm a true believer in this whole um, Z Health methodology, and this is mm. something I want to learn for my own because I think this is very very beneficial for people. And I know a lot of people in that field. They are hosting workshops, so we will rent that place to those people. We will make it possible that they can have a fully equipped gym so that can literally do everything, which is for the competitive side of CrossFit. So, and that might tie in well into my next question. I think it's probably one piece of it, those kinds of facilities that allow for people who want to be, who are comp competitive to really just train and do the work and not, like you said, um, maybe clash with the, the other kind of formats that there are in terms of uh, how to organize a gym, how to run a gym, how to run a CrossFit gym. For you, so again, besides those, uh, those facilities for professional athletes or for competitive athletes, what is the next big thing in CrossFit? What's the next step uh, that is going to take that sport, that whole community to the next level? Um, I think the next step that needs to happen or should happen is we need to find one concept on the sports side on because in the, at the moment I have the feeling this sanctioned event is doing this. You are a good runner, a good swimmer. You're good in, I don't know, uh, aerobic capacity workouts. You better go to that sanctioned event because it's a high chance that you qualify to, to the games. Mm -hmm. To me, there's too much variety going on at the moment. Then we're having these national champions. Then we have countries, nothing against this country, but they have three CrossFit gyms. And then all of a sudden we have someone at the CrossFit games and then this poor person just goes there at the games and just suffers in the first workout and can just barely do one round. Mm. I mean, don't please, please. Uh, this, this maybe sounds very hard to people who are listening to that. I, I'm, please do it. Go there. I'm very grateful for everything. Everyone who wants to go to a CrossFit game and experience it to be on that competition floor. I can 100% understand that, but we have a too big of a gap then. And then, but mainly this whole sanction event thing, this whole how to qualify for the games, I think we need a better and clear concept. So some sort of rule book and guideline that everyone still has some, some, some room to play around with it, mm -hmm. but you need to be within a, certain, uh, within a certain area so that if you're a good runner and a good swimmer, you can guarantee yourself qualifying for the games going to that one sanction event. I think that needs to be kicked out. And then the second thing here we're talking about CrossFit as a training methodology for people to get healthy, doing it as a fitness program, mm -hmm. is the education of the, of the coaches is getting way, way better. Don't get me wrong, but to be allowed, to be guaranteed to call yourself a CrossFit coach that is allowed to actually coach people mm. needs to be way higher. Mm. And I don't know if they, in the end it's more levels because I think at the moment it's level, is it level four already? There's three level or four three for, least, yeah. Three for, for sure. sure. Yeah. Three for sure. But four I, I can tell you, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm also not sure. Let's say in the end it's six levels and you need to get at least up to level three to then be allowed to use the word CrossFit in your gym or use it's for you as a coach to mm -hmm. promote yourself out there as a, as a CrossFit coach mm -hmm. and then getting a lot more into detail and getting a lot into that whole mental side of things and this whole interacting with people. Mm -hmm. I think it's very easy to understand, okay, this is how an air squat should look like. This is how, a, 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 I don't know, a net ball clean should look like. This is how a pull-up should look like. This, we can fix that in the level one. But level two, what they're already doing is how to manage a group, how to work with people. But I think this needs, we need to put a lot more emphasis on people because everyone is so individual. Mm -hmm. Everyone is so different. There's a lot of people, they set a foot into a CrossFit gym. There's standing there for one minute and they're just freakingly scared because a loud, like I'm a loud person. I'm super <laughs> extroverted. I'm like, I'm, I'm way a hundred kilograms. And then I'm running to that person. like, Hey, how are you doing? And then, a lot of people still get scared of that sport because they're in there and then they see those shirtless people and it's like, oh, what is going in here? So the social interaction with people, potential clients for your CrossFit gym, I think that can be improved as well. I'm 
uh, side note, maybe mm -hmm. they've implemented a lot more in that already. I haven't checked anything of the level one, two, or three, but this is just my last, like my last idea I have about this because I right, did my right, level right. two last year. Mm -hmm. And I don't think with all the stuff that happened in the in the last year with CrossFit in the name that they put a lot more like a lot more emphasis on changing that. I know mm. they're doing a lot, but I think this can be improved even more. I wanted to come back on the first point that you mentioned. If, if you allow me to maybe push back just a little bit on the idea, um, don't you think that standardizing the competition process more obviously has its benefits, like you said, but doesn't that take away from the nature of the CrossFit competition as it was set up from the very beginning, the unknown, the unknowable and getting to athletes to face something that they, they cannot, they cannot exactly prepare for. There is going to be uh, some variation in there. And if we put too many constraints on what sanctional events can and can't do, then maybe we lose that special spark that, that is, I think an integral part of what, you know, CrossFit competition is as, especially at the higher level. Yeah, 100% love your question and the constraints you were talking about. This is true and uh, this will ultimately happen if you limit movements. If you say like you can only do this and that, no other movements, period. It will get super boring. Everyone will just get super good at these movements and then they come to the CrossFit Games and then you look at them like doing other movements. They're like, why, how, man? How did you get to the CrossFit Games? What I, what I mean by standardizing, uh, making everything a little bit more standard and having like a, like a, a level of or like a, um, yeah, making everything standard so that it doesn't fall apart here and there is um, let's say we need, we need a short-term workout. Then we need to test a longer term per workout. Then we need to test medium. Then we need to test raw strength. We need to test this mm. because then what comes into the, into the uh, best example, I'm a very good athlete. I, I would call myself a very good athlete. I'm still on a, on a fairly high level, but when you see me doing heavy deadlifts and burpee over bar, people look at me as like, you are telling me you're fit because I don't know. And I'm still working on that. This combination for my system and my body is something that makes me super tired as well. So let's say we put these two movements in a medium type ish workout. Let's say 20 calories, by 20 burpees over bar, 10 very heavy deadlifts. I would be so bad in this workout. I would not be good. But then we would have a medium workout with high with very, let's say 150 kilogram deadlifts, which is very heavy. Mm. Um, we have this with very heavy deadlifts. So me as a programmer for a competition, I can make a check on this, but let's go to another competition and say like, okay, we have, let's say I'm super good with um, toes to bars, ski erg and overhead squats. Let's have, to, let's have a, a simple workout. Again, five rounds. It is um, 20 calorie ski. It is 20 toes to bar. And then it is 10 overhead squats at 100 kilograms. Mm. I would be very good at this workout because these movements fit me very well. Two diff completely different workouts, but both medium time domain with a heavy, with a heavy implementation, but two same athlete, two completely different outputs. Mm. And I think if we would give people constraints about this telling them like okay you need to have a medium then a long then here monostructure blah 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 not three times running first is a 5k then we have a, a, a triathlon and then we have a 20k row mm -hmm. not three times more structure like this i think that would help us a lot getting um um more athletes towards the crossfit games who are on the same level and not having someone who's just very good at very specific things because then we, we still have this excitement because you don't know how this medium worker with a heavy part will look like it can be mm -hmm. either this or that mm -hmm. hope that makes sense yeah it does and and it's maybe without maybe that at least in my mind that's what i see has emerged from even the cross games over the last five years uh, you know there's probably going to be some agility or some sprint you know there's going to be at least a couple heavy barbells of some kind uh, there's going to be like a max clean or a max snatch or a ladder of some kind. You know, you're going to have a, a really long and annoying uh, like marathon row or you <laughs> oh have, you gosh. know, a long trail run. Was it a few years ago in Aromas? They had, yeah. I don't know how long it, it was, but it was fairly long. There was the, the paddle and, and, and swim, I believe, last year or the year before. So you, you kind of, you know, in general, what's going to happen. And I see your point of maybe not on the individual workouts themselves, but really on the, the general 
uh, framework of the competition saying, okay, yeah. if you have a three day competition, we need at least, you know, one short, one medium, one long, and then one test of strength and then one test of, of, uh, I guess, I guess that would make sense to, like you said, so e every competition is more evenly programmed for instead of having, like you said, very skewed programming on one, uh, on one competition. And like, a, a good friend who, who trains close by here, he went to a competition in France, for example, and he said, uh, recently it was it was a small amateur competition but he went there and it was they did like 800 squats in total over like two days it was it was a ridiculous amount of like air squats and then there was barbell squats and then there was other squats no. they just did so much of one thing and at the end of the weekend he was like almost disgusted being like well you know what it was it was cool to compete it was cool to get back in the in that train of things but just the programming was brutal, man. So I yeah. can see your point of having some standard of, of kind of, yeah. you know, organizing those, those different. Yeah, we should, we should not take the spark away from those competitions, but we still need yeah. to give them some sort of rules and guidelines so you can, agree. they can use to make it look the same throughout the whole season. Yeah, I, I, t I totally agree with you on that. Patrick, I wanted to finish uh, the chat today with a few rapid fire questions for you. So if you could try and uh, keep those uh, next answers in as few words as possible, uh, let's, let's get started. So first of all, one defining moment in your uh, coaching career as a CrossFit coach. Uh, I coached um, a person who, has eating, who had eating disorder and um, she couldn't even walk. She was so light that she couldn't even walk we started training i had to take a step back for me as a coach to the basics basics so we started teaching her how to walk over plates mm -hmm. at the beginning and then after i would say eight to nine to ten weeks she was we were at the point where she was actually able to run without me running next to her so i told her run there come back to me this is our goal for today she runs back to me crying having tears in her eyes i was like are you in pain she comes to me she hugs me she's just like since two years, I couldn't run. And now after this time we're working here, you made me able to walk and run again. Mm. And I'm so grateful and happy for that. And this still gives me goosebumps when I hear that. And this made me, I knew that you can take that to the lowest level. Someone who's not even able to run. Like she mm. could walk, but mm, shaky, but running again, like jogging very low to a very high athlete who, misses in finishing on the podium so you can take it up to that and up mm. to that and this moment here at the very low for that person just defined me as a coach i was like i want to help people get better yeah i think that's that's fantastic i think it's um you know maybe speaking for a lot of people but one of the main reasons that we do what we do is you know giving abilities to people that maybe they lost or maybe they never had or never yeah. thought that they could have 100%. and actually you know getting them there so I think that's a, that's a great little story that you said that you talked about here. Um, one thing that you've changed your mind about in CrossFit in general and why? Um, intensity isn't everything. Um, I think I've said it a million times in that podcast. Being an athlete, getting to a certain level is not defined by intensity. It's about how to train smart and taking intensity off your system gives it more capability of improving on so many different levels because what people don't realize these days is intensity makes your body feel tired and that's what they that's, that's probably the first thing they feel because uh, i'm tired but then your ligaments your joints your nerve system all these kind of other things that are still happening but you don't really feel them are also happening so intensity doesn't define you as an athlete it's what defines you as an athlete is train smart and get your system and work with the intensity that fits for your body the perfect way. What are you currently studying or working on for yourself as a coach? Mm, I am working, I'm not trying to educate myself. I did in the past, like a year ago, I did the essentials course, Z Health. This is super interesting to me. And what I'm doing here right now is um, I'm trying to take a different approach here because I know my system has a, a lot. Some, some stuff which is not working perfectly fine. And what I'm doing here now, I am investing at the moment in um, a Z Health coach. She's called Tina. She lives close by here in Cologne. And I even worked with her when I was not in Cologne. And I'm trying to 
take a different approach here. I want to experience a new thing that I want to be able to do in the future. So I will definitely educate myself. Mm. But first, I want to take the step in experiencing the product. So I'm constantly having Z Health um, sessions with her tomorrow, 9 a.m. in the morning. I'll drive to her. We have a session. She will coach me for one hour. Then I'm impl implementing everything into my daily life. And this is something I'm putting into my abilities of being a coach. So this is the next, next big thing for me, uh, I would say. What's one book that you would recommend? Oh, what's one book that I would recommend? Um, training, non-training, it doesn't matter. Okay, okay, okay. Far away from training, a book that I loved reading uh, was, um, it was actually two books. The first book is, um, I think it's called How to, F How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah. Lo love it, it's so good. And then the second one, I don't know the English word for that, but it's, um, if you were to translate the German, um, the German um, title. title, it would be um, Coffee at the Corner of Earth. So it's, um, I'll, find the, I'll find the title in, okay. because it's written in English, I'll find yeah. the title for you. Cool. It was just, it's, it's a very short book. It's mind blowing yeah. and it's just, oh, it's so good. And Let's get to the, to the emotional, side, or emotional side a little bit. A book that, I don't know why, it got recommended to me a few times on very different occasions. And I was like, why do you recommend that book to me? And it sounds super weird when I'm saying that right now, but it helps the interaction with people. It is called Five Different Languages of Love, okay? Yeah. It sounds super cheeky and super loud. No, I'm, I'm familiar now? with the book. Yeah, I'm familiar yeah. with the book. And it is so good. I read it and I was like, oh my gosh, this is, it is, again, super short, very well written. Please, guys, ladies and gentlemen, read that because it will help you in your daily life when you're talking with your relationship partner, with friends, with other people. It's good. And I got, this got recommended to me by um, coaches and people in relationships. So it came up a few times. I was like, mm -hmm. I need to read that shit now. Yeah. I think it's what, you know, what you're saying between, um, Dale Carnegie's book, how to win friends and influence people. And then this one you just mentioned, I think the more, the more I move forward in coaching, the more you realize that our job is, uh, we're in, in the people business. Yes. Yeah. You need to be able to write programs, et cetera, but you need to change habits. And, yeah. and for that, you need to create a connection that people can relate to. And yeah. then through this, you can actually, you know, give what you have to give in terms of yeah. your knowledge, your information, your, all that yeah. process. But first and foremost, it's a people, it's a people thing. Um, next yeah. question. What's a coach that people should follow and why? Louis Simmons. I mean, this is a super funny and an awesome dude. And when he's, I think for people who are not familiar with English, it's sometimes hard to understand him. Mm -hmm. I just, I just love the way he coaches. I love his approach and he's a freaking genius. His mind is so great. So just, I think he has a podcast. He has a YouTube channel. He has mm -hmm. Instagram, just Westside Barber, three, two, one, go hundred percent. What's one athlete that people should follow and why? Oh, I was, I, I was hoping not to ask, answer that question because there's, <laughs> yeah, because there's maybe, I maybe love, someone, sorry to cut you off, maybe someone who, you know, is not a hundred percent mainstream yet, but is doing really good things or interesting things, or is speaking about his process as an athlete in a certain way that resonates with you. Um, Kevin. One, the Kevin, the guy I'm working with, like he's mm -hmm. also my athlete. I mean, I'm just working recently with him for six months. He is very similar to eight. Um, I would, if you would have, if I would have, if I would have need to answer the question on a top level, I would probably say still Adrian, even though he's a close friend of mine now. Mm -hmm. But every time I go to him and I see him, he's so calm and he trains and it's not that schnick schnack here. It's just, he's training and then it's not fancy. It's basic and I just love it. And it doesn't feel like he's training 24 seven constantly. He's a games athlete and it feels, right. it calms me down as a person. And <laughs> the same, the same stuff is in, um, is in Kevin. He's super calm. He knows when to train. He knows when to push. He knows when to take an additional rest day. He knows when to contact me. He's like, Hey dude, I need to put intensity down here. And this is something that I, I think is, is very good. And now thinking about it, um, also an athlete I support a little bit. That's the reason why I got to know her a little bit more is Rebecca Vitteson from Denmark. Okay. She is, uh, she is also very like, 
she, her passion for that sport and the way she trains, the way she um, wants to achieve bigger goals is very great. She, she is willing to take help. She's giving stuff away where she's not the best at so she can really focus on being an athlete and mm. her passion and then the way she promotes herself online on Instagram and to other people is very good because people can identify with her and this is what in my opinion in the end brings more people to move and brings more people towards the fact of doing it maybe also as a sport and this is something I think is is very beneficial in these days where we have a lot more people starting to move but still health issues happening all over the world. Um, Pat it was Absolute pleasure having you on today. Where can people find out, find out more about you if they want to follow you, if they want to find your program? Where do they go? Oh, that's a tricky one uh, because um, I, my sister would laugh now because she says, like, tell them the package, the under dash programming. The most I would say I, I post it as if you want to get in touch with me as a person, it is mm -hmm. uh, at pack two for two. That's me, my, me as an athlete. Uh, me as a person, me as a freak that I'm sitting right here. But if you want to get to know me about my programming, it's probably um, the package under dash programming. That's, um, that's probably how to connect with me. Cool. And then I'm still very new in this sport, even though I do it over several years now. So uh, to everyone who's listening to this year right now, feel free to contact me. I'm on, I'm, be basically answering everything. There's no stupid question, just, just stupid answers. And if there's probably one thing, um, you haven't asked me that, uh, but I have the feeling to put it out to the people. If there's Go one thing that I, if there's one thing that I've changed in the last year, I would say in my life is I have a professional person to, who works with me and she hates the fact that I call her a therapist and blah, 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 whatsoever. But we came up to the, she's, a, she's um, helping with character de development, personal mm -hmm. development. We live in an environment that is very pressuring for a lot of people. Um, I was overworked last year. Mid last year, I was very stressed out, burned out, overworked. And I couldn't, like, I had so many projects and things on my table. I was working easily more than 60, 70, 80 hours per week. And mm -hmm. I was just exhausted. I trained on top of that. So my brain was just collapsing. It was just too much. And having someone who is objectively looking at you as a person and is not judging anything and is helping you is the greatest thing that I've done in the last year. And I've, my, I feel mentally speaking, I feel so fresh. I feel good. I'm energized. I know what is important in my life. So I know where I need to put my energy to. And last year, I would have probably have another five projects on my table, but I learned to say no. And it's, you should not be ashamed of, having the fact that someone can look at you and tell you like, okay, you can improve here, you can improve that. And I think people are very like sensitive to that topic. It's like, I'm not, I don't need any help. I think we have a lot of pressure and mental stuff happening at the moment. I mean, you know that as well. Instagram mm -hmm. is probably the most stupid thing when it comes to mental issues <laughs> at the moment. It is, it is, it is like, it is how it, it is how it is, but still, it's not a shame to ask for help if there's anything. And this is the best thing that I've done in the past year. I'm still working with her on a monthly basis. And I will probably do that for the rest of my life because it just feels refreshing and it takes pressure off my shoulder. No, I think it's a very important point that you bring up and I appreciate you, you know, being open to, to sharing this with everybody. I think it's, it's probably something that also it's, it's interesting, the parallel between what you're saying now on an individual level, your individual level, psychologically, you know, actually, using someone for like an out an outside view like a, a like you said a, a therapist a psychologist or uh, whatever title that person might have for you that's actually helping you reflect on you know how you think what you think how you see yourself what you do on a daily basis and always having that essentially having that kind of self-reflection um, on a, on an ongoing yeah. basis, instead of just having checkpoints when you get sick or when you get, you know, injured yeah. and all those things, 100%. just like, and like you said, I think, and I, and I, and I do want to, you know, go just for another minute on that, because I think it's a very important point that you brought up the idea that working with a therapist or a psychologist, um, is bad in a way is that you have a problem but yeah, we, we have no this, problem yeah. we have no problem going to nutrition coaches and to training coaches but 100%. then when you talk about 
uh, you could call it a coach, like a, like a thought coach, like a, sure. a, somebody who's specialized in how do you structure your thinking? How do you structure your value system, your, your beliefs, your expectations, uh, how you talk to yourself in your head, uh, what you say about yourself, what you put on your plate, what you try to, how do you manage your stress levels? I think that's not talked about enough. And I, I, like, again, I just appreciate you bringing that up as, yeah. as an important point for people to, to walk away with. And it's not all about the physical far from it. It's we're an integrated system and the brain is one of the main yeah. p- 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 pieces in that puzzle. Yeah. And so I think, you know, paying more attention to that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And you just touched the topic and especially we as male, like, males, not the females, we as male persons on earth, we are just so scared of the fact, oh, this shows weakness, we should be strong, we should be alphas, I'm like, fuck that shit, it's totally fine to cry as a male, it is totally fine to take your mask down and be vulnerable, it is, Mm. it's touching all this emotional part again, and people are very sensitive with that, and they're not comfortable talking about it, and when I talk about it, maybe that's why it's important. To talk yeah, about 100%. Yeah. And, and, and 100%. And hundred percent. And it's, for example, with my therapist, she never, like a lot of people think you go there, sit on a chair and they make you cry. They make you feel miserable. That's not what's happening. They try to help you. I've never cried in that sessions. I, it, it was sometimes like I was sitting there was like, was mind blown. I was like, okay, what's happening here? And we also, we had a few sessions where like, I would love to jump up because she triggers a few things. Like I would just jump up and run out here because shut right. up. Yeah, but yeah, it was yeah. good that she did that. And it helped me, it helped me develop as a person and, talking about books there's a very good book that's called the mask of masculinity mm. very good one um you could you should read it and then um oh shit um jim quick uh, limitless is also a very good book right. because he talks he talks a lot about the brain right awesome book loved it I'm still not through it because i started reading it last week um, but what i read so far is just amazing and guys ladies and gentlemen get your brain fixed and I fix <laughs> i don't mean i don't mean that you're sick or unhealthy, it is just our environment. Our brain is not made for this input that we're getting at the moment. And along the way, we consumed too much and there is probably some sort of, I don't want to call it problems, but a few things you could tweak here and there to just feel a little bit more relaxed and and not as stressful and learn to say no and having like a, yeah, having a better life, just being more calm and relaxed. And this is just, a massive takeaway I had when I took the step of working with her in the past and still and ongoing in the future, probably. Well, Pat, again, I really appreciate you one coming on today and two sharing all those things with everybody. And, uh, I look forward to, you know, having you on again in the future sometime. Thank you, mate. This is, I think that's just the fourth podcast. I think we, I've never talked that long. I love it. Um, I mean, you, you probably saw that. I love talking. It was a pleasure having you mate, because what you're doing, you are very well prepared as Thanks, soon as man. I was finished with my, as soon as I, as I was finished with my answers, you had the next question in line. There was never any stopping. It felt very fluent, and to me, it felt like forty-five minutes. But when I look at the time now, it's over two hours almost. It is. It is. You did an amazing job, and I wish you Thanks, all the man. best. Whenever you need anything, just contact me. And uh, looking forward to have to have me on your podcast again if you want that. All right, uh, I really appreciate all those uh, kind words of yours, and uh, wish you a great day, man. You're the best. Thank you so much.